All right, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for everyone who's joining today. Um, today we're gonna be talking about uh, waterproofing techniques and innovations in liquid applied flashings. It's presented by uh, the team at Tower Sealants. We've got both uh, Joe and Rob on today who are gonna be presenting today's course. And um, before we go ahead and get started, we're gonna give a quick little intro about Ace Lab, show you how to find today's presenters on Ace Lab. So if you have any follow-up questions and wanna connect with them after today's webinar, that's a great place to go. Um, my colleague, Helen, is Ace Lab's Director of Architect Experience. So she's gonna go ahead and give that quick intro and then we'll get started with today's topic. So Helen, uh, looks like we've got a good amount of folks joining already. So feel free to take it away whenever you're ready. Sounds good. Thanks, Bo. Hey, everyone. Um, as Bo mentioned, I'm the Director of Architect Experience here. I'm, my job is to make sure you all have a nice experience on the website, find what you need to find. Um, and so on that note, let's talk about how you can get in touch with, uh, with Tower Sealant. So um, up here in the top, we have this bar here. Anytime that you might know the product that you want to be using on a project or you're looking for a specific manufacturer, type in their name here, go to Brands, and then here we're going to select Tower Sealants. Um, what you'll see here is their overall page. You can hit contact here to send a message to um, Joe and his team. Uh, that will then show up here in your workspace in your conversations. So that's how that will look. You can read a little bit more about them. Watch this great video. The other thing you can do is you can go through and see all their products across the different categories. You can then save these in to your various um, projects. So just showing you all the great options here. You have the ability to see more as well. So you can save all of these and then basically create a nice list within your project of all the tower sealants products you're going to use. Um, where this is all going, I'm really excited to speak to is that coming out in September is going to be a little bit more functionality within Ace Lab. So right now I jumped into showing you what exists currently. So if I was to jump back to this page here and save, say, all these different sealants, I'd be able to generate a comparison of those different sealants and their performance across the board. So this exists currently. Um, but what's also coming is that everything you then save and create a comparison for will auto-populate into a schedule for you across the various building categories. With this, so with the tower sealants folks, for example, you could have all the sealants that you plan on using in your project. They'd all be listed here. You can keep track of their approvals. Um, all these columns are customizable for you, so you can really have it match whatever your current drawing set and documentation looks like. You'd be able to note what other projects it's been used in, and then you'd also be able to see which reps you're speaking with. Some other fun things about this is the ability then, if you say, hey, I really like using these tower sealants products, let's use them on the next project, or these three. You can select those, come over here, and you'll be able to import those into your next project. So that's the idea of where we're going with Ace Lab is really being your one-stop shop from search all the way to spec. Uh, we are allowing some folks to have early access to this starting in July, which would mean that you can come in, save everything, export this as a CSV, drop it into your drawing sets. So um, really looking forward to bring this to y'all. And this will also kind of preload at the beginning of a spec book for you as well. So this is all coming out. If you want to meet with me and learn more about that early access group, I would love to chat. In the meantime, you'll hear from myself or my colleague, Evelyn, um, after Tower Sealants, just following up on your questions there. So hope you'll have a good session. Thanks so much for your time. Awesome. Thank you so much, Helen. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in uh, meeting with Helen, signing up for that beta program, feel free to fill out that quick poll that we have up now. Um, before we go ahead and get started, just want to give everyone a quick reminder to please use the Q&A throughout today's presentation. You can submit any questions or comments there for our presenters. Um, we should have some time to get to some of those questions live at the end of today's presentation. And if we don't get to your question live today, we'll have a record of it so that you can be followed up with after today's event. All right, that's it for me. Um, Joe and Rob, whenever you're ready, feel free to uh, share your screen and get started. Perfect. Thank you, Bo and Helen. working can you see yep all good i can see okay, i just want to make sure that it's the um presentation is working yep yeah it's uh looks good it's in presenter mode oh here we go sorry
Sorry about that, everyone. I uh, really appreciate your time today. My name is Joe DePiro. I'm the Director of Sales and Marketing here at Tower Sealants. With me is Rob Stannard. He's our Chief Quality Officer and our Head Chemist. Uh, we are going to go over uh, quite a few things today, um, looking at our agenda. First, we're going to introduce you to Tower Sealants. Uh, we're going to go over some waterproofing methods for vertical walls, because that's the uh, the relevant application for us. We're going to take a look at waterproofing sealants, uh, kind of double click on sealants, what are sealants, uh, the different technologies, as well as the methodologies for expansion joints. And then we're going to introduce our AU1 commercial construction sealant. We'll go over some uh, product benefits and case studies. Then we will go into a product innovation. This is our AU1 liquid applied flashing. And from then we should have some, uh, some time, we're hoping to have some time for some question and answers as well. So Tower Sealants is a division of MD Building Products, formerly uh, known as Macklinburg Duncan. MD is a hundred year old plus weatherization products manufacturer. So anything from weather stripping to door sweeps, Stephen backer rods, and of course, cocks and sealants. Uh, MD was actually the first company to introduce the cock tube delivery system to consumers. This was uh, 75 years ago in 1949. So um, sealants are definitely in our DNA. Uh, Tower was founded in 2006 in Gainesville, Georgia. The founding principles of Tower realized that the professional contractor demanded kind of a, a level of quality that was not quite on the market. There was a gap between what was out there and what was available and what the professional contractor demanded. So they decided to create another caulk manufacturing company. This actually created a very unique situation since they could buy brand new pharmaceutical grade equipment and tie that in with uh, brand new formulations made for that equipment. So we started off with, you know, the a regular painter's cocks line. We have now CA, CA34 painter's cocks, C920 interior exterior sealants, construction sealants. And we've gotten uh, along the years into more innovative products such as the uh, DuPont Tyvek residential sealant and a few of the products we're gonna talk about today. So we are still headquartered in Gainesville, Georgia. And we also have distribution centers in uh, Milton, Canada and Oklahoma City. That's the uh, HQ of MD Building Products. And uh, within our management team is over 140 plus years in uh, the sealant industry, some lifers. Uh, Rob, I'll let you introduce yourself. Okay, always kind of strange to do that. So as mentioned, I am the uh, Chief Quality Officer, but I'm the Vice President of Chemical Technology. I've been an R&D professional uh, in the building products area uh, since the early 80s. Um, as you can see, I worked for uh, Gardner Industries, and there we had uh, companies such as APOC, which was a roofing company, Sun Coatings, Gardner Asphalt, and of course, Sealant Technologies. I uh, ran a group for what became Dow Chemical, started as Union Carbide, uh, manufacturing the emulsion polymers, the glues that actually go into the manufacture of sealants. And so I have a, a core understanding of that technology. And I started out with a company called USG Corporation. Uh, USG owned Durabond and DAP at the time. And so that was a really, really good primer into this industry. There's some accolades. I've been with ASTM since 86, been on the board, been chairman of some committees. That's all on the, the material there. But basically, I've been an R&D professional uh, working on mitigating air and water infiltration into buildings since the early 80s. Tower really has built its reputation on quality. Um, so obviously the professional painter or the professional applicator demands a more uniform product than the DYI person. And we understand that. So we look at every raw material coming in, um, our polymers are evaluated by FTIR to make sure that they are correct. Um, <clears throat> we check everything real time. So every batch, we don't do random. Every one of our batches goes through full QC. 
Uh, we have a retention process that allows us to have retains for any batch we make for two full years. Every claim that we make has third-party testing to verify it. We don't like to, we obviously do testing in-house, but then we want to verify that. Because we're in, interacting with the professional, um, we do a lot of compatibility testing with other products that are in the professional market at this time. And that's to make sure that we work well together with products that are already there. One of the unique things that we have is, is that all of our cartridges and manufacturing is done under vacuum. Uh, we pull about 26 inches of mercury, which allows no air entrainment. We don't get air pockets. You don't get those little pops. You don't get the run out if you're using a caulk or sealant. And when you're looking at any type of coating material, obviously you don't want pinholing because that affects your performance as well. Um, that's pretty much it. We do test more than just the standard STM three substrates, which are cement, uh, aluminum, and glass. At this time, we're checking 30 top building materials, and these materials are all available at places like uh, Lowe's Depot or other big boxes. Perfect. Thank you. Let's move on to the waterproofing methods for vertical walls. So um, surprisingly, or, or not surprisingly, when you uh, bring up division seven to a specifier, it, you you get a face that maybe thinks it's you know it's not the most exciting or fun division, uh, but nobody's going to discount its importance. Um, you know, as in a rough opening, if there's a crack or a gap, water is going to find a way into that building. That's going to cause physical damage. Um, it could be you know it could cause mold mildew issues, which is you know a health effects and a health hazard. It can also be a fire hazard from water damage, uh, physical slip and fall hazards, as well as you know inefficiencies in the building envelope system, which means you wasted energy. Um, and then of course the aesthetic is is never good. So uh, we're hoping that after this, you know maybe uh, before you copy and paste a, an old Office Master, you take a look at uh, some of the newer technologies and consider the the durability and the uh, longevity of what's being specified. So when we're talking just vertical walls, because that's the application that our sealants are are used in here, uh, there's a few methods here, and we're not we're leaving out some. There's 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 more than just a few methods, but a few that we're going to speak about today uh, is just house wrap, which is you know very widely used. You can see it anywhere residents are being built. Uh, this is a reliable technology, um, fairly easy install, pretty cost efficient, but is very time consuming. And um, I mean, it is, you know, by it's a fabric, so it is prone to tearing. Um, looking at joint sealing, this is more of a commercial waterproofing system. There's no cladding necessary over a slab. So what you're doing is you're waterproofing the expansion joints. This is very durable when done correctly. Uh, with the correct materials, we're probably going to zoom in on that a little bit. It's a great aesthetic as the coating can cover the whole thing and make it very uniform. And um, something to think about is the UV on the sealant with some of these technologies in the sealants. Uh, there is a newer method that we're, we'll talk a little bit later on. This is liquid flashing plus the house wrap or the um, preferred cladding. This is an extra layer of protection. It started down in uh, Florida from the wind-driven rain, and uh, it's gaining a lot of popularity. And then you have your all-encompassing liquid vapor barrier. Uh, there are many different manufacturers and technologies for this right now. Um, again, this is relatively new, uh, more expensive, but very quick if you have the right labor for it. So looking at the products relevant for this, um, obviously house wrap, the sealants, with the liquid applied flashing, you're gonna use that and the wrap with the cladding and your liquid vapor barrier product. Please note all of these products are still gonna require the use of a sealant in a, you know, a rough opening or a perimeter. So sealants 101, um, we're just gonna go over, you know, our real definition here um, where do they go and, and kind of the different 
choices technologies you have here. So a sealant is a flexible material you can put in a joint gap or crack in a paste or liquid form. It'll cure or harden, and it will protect against gas and liquid entry. They're made, you know, like I said, from flexible materials. And these flexible materials are to deal with the expansion and contraction of these substrates of the building. Um, for this isn't, uh, I guess, Bible vernacular, but we refer to as a C920 compliant C, uh, product as a sealant. This would be more of a waterproofing product. The C834, which is a less stringent test, would be referred to as a caulk. This would be your painter's caulks, your um, you know, opening price point painter's caulks. So why choose one over the other? There's a lot of factors to consider here. Um, big thing would be obviously be interior, exterior. Is this going to have to protect the cladding or the building envelope, or is this just for aesthetics? Uh, the substrates, the substrates, the substrates and the applications, sorry. Uh, is this going to be above or below grade? Um, considering the type of paint or coating you're going to use, or if you're going to paint or coat it. And then um, the performance requirements, as well as obviously the environmental demands of the, the region where this application is. Looking at why sealants fail, it's not always just the uh, the right technology in the, in the wrong substrate. Sometimes it's just, you know, inadequate surface prep and or application missing a tool. Um, obviously a, a low performance sealant and a high performing or high movement joint, you're gonna get mechanical failure, push out or separation. Um, looking at, you know, using the, uh, an incompatible product for a marine application or below grade. And then um, looking at, there's some adverse reactions that could happen from different sealant technologies. We're gonna get into that a little more. There is a term called reversion. I'm gonna to refer to you, Rob, on explaining that one. Okay, so reversion is a word uh, that is actually divine, defined uh, in ASTM. Um, it basically states that under some conditions, polyurethane sealants can actually go back to their original state. In other words, they'll look very much like they were in the tube. It Okay. Now we're going to go over some of the technologies real quick. So we want to start out with your basic materials, which are latexes and what we call vinyls. Um, they were used quite a bit in the past. They still have some in the opening level of price points. Cure by water evaporation. Uh, basic residential. Uh, we say weather sealing and painting, uh, more so even um, interior. Uh, they're very easy to clean, uh, water cleanup, no solvents are required whatsoever. Very low odor or a very low ammonia odor is typical. Um, they have reasonable adhesion to most common construction substrates, uh, but they do have limits. Um, they should not and cannot be used where there's water immersion. They're not made for joints that have uh, what we call dynamic joint movement, significant joint movement. Uh, they're not good for high heat. And particularly when we talk about the word vinyl, which is uh, one of the constituents of the glue, uh, they just don't do well in, in UV or in water. Silicones are pretty well known. Uh, probably everybody here is aware of them. Uh, there are a number of types. Uh, we talk about neutral acid and chemical cure. Uh, they're basically all chemical cures. So uh, the neutral and uh, <clears throat> atoxy, acetoxy, uh, they basically take moisture out of the atmosphere and they have a chemical reaction with a catalyst that cures them. Um, this chemical curing does demands that you do have that catalyst. There are a lot of uses. Uh, silicones are used in, in many applications and do well. Electronics, gaskets, uh, you can see them listed, uh, glazing, particularly for structural applications, silicones are the king, uh, and general construction. They are water resistant, durable, flexible, heat resistance, and they have very good adhesion to glass. 
limitations. In areas where you want might want to remodel or paint, you cannot use this product without special types of primers. Paint will not adhere to silicone. Uh, they have very poor tear resistance. In other words, if they're damaged, say by a nail, uh, even something as simple as a um, a weed whacker, uh, they'll once they start to tear, any movement and that tear propagates. Alkali. So when you think about something like the acetoxy, they give off um, a type of acid uh, when they cure. And so they have very poor alkali compatibility. They will react with things like cement. And so you absolutely re uh, demand a primer. Um, based on the same statement, they can cause corrosion on metals. So what we've seen often also is what's called staining or bleeding uh, into uh, substrates. Uh, it's called bloom. I mean, and you can see it on natural stones, particularly if it rains, you'll see discoloration around the areas, not exactly where the sealant is, but expanding past where the sealant was, oftentimes many inches past. And so it gives a very strange look to the substrate. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Absolutely needs solvents for cleanup. Um, you cannot clean with water, and the odor can be very strong with acetoxy. Polyurethanes. Polyurethanes are used uh, quite a bit. Uh, like uh, silicones, they cure with a chemical reaction, uh, used in automotive, uh, industrial parking areas, sidewalks, gutters, tilt-ups, general construction. Excellent tear resistance, great adhesion, and they're very good for continuous water immersion. Problems. Uh, short shelf life, but their biggest issue is the resistance to UV. Uh, that is the Achilles heel of polyurethanes. Uh, they can have paint compatibility issues. While you can paint them, because they contain plasticizers or a type of oil for flexibility, they can uh, either discolor or change the sheen of a paint. They can be very tacky, uh, difficult to tool. Uh, solvents are used in the formulations, but more importantly, they are created using isocyanates, and that's not a, one of our favorite chemicals. And they do use plasticizers, all of them. Have to clean it with solvents. Um, and then I mentioned reversion earlier, so I won't go back over it, but that's definitely a problem for polyurethanes. Hybrids. Hybrids are kind of a, a interesting animal. They're a blend. Uh, they use both the best parts, theoretically, of silicones and urethanes. Um, they can have very high solids, good strength, good initial adhesion. And good water resistance often can be used below grade. Uh, used often in windows, doors, um, kitchen, bath, we say roofing. Definitely used for interior and exterior. They're water resistant, durable, and flexible. They have excellent adhesion to glass. Um, they're also paintable, but they have the same issue that urethanes do. They definitely can cause shiners. Uh, no isocyanates, and they have a low odor. Um, Limitations are very similar in some. Short shelf life, while they claim better UV resistance, testing has shown that many of the formulations in the market today still have very poor UV resistance. They're very difficult to tool. They're tacky. It's very hard to get a good uniform bead. Uh, they do, most of them, and I, I say most because I don't know any that don't, uh, but I'm sure someone's working on it, but they contain what are called phthalates, and phthalates are pretty much getting outlawed in, in Europe. And if you look in the United States, they're considered um, a problematic chemical. Uh, same paint compatibility issues we talked about with the urethane. So they can cause shiners and um, that can either be with a discoloration in the color or a difference in gloss where the sealant is. Have to use solvents to clean. And then they are good quality, but they are definitely higher in cost as well. Took a sip of water there. You have to excuse me for a moment. So an acrylic urethane. Strengths of this, and this is our AU1, um, excellent adhesion to common construction substrates. So we'll go over that in more detail later. Uh, they are used both in residential commercial construction, weather sealing, and uh, waterproofing and tilt-up. Long-term durability and extraordinarily good UV resistance. Paintability is a key strength rather than a limitation for this product. 
extremely easy to apply and tool, saves time and money. It is definitely easy to clean. It's water cleanup until cured. Once cured, very hard to clean. So any cleaning you want to do, you want to do while the product is still uncured. Uh, we don't use solvents. They're not necessary. Low VOCs. And again, very low odor or odorless during cure. Um, limitations, similar as others, we don't want to have water immersion. Uh, we do not do structural. Uh, that, that is still a venue that is dominated, as I mentioned earlier, by silicone. So uh, we don't want to be the only product holding in uh, in a structural way. Uh, we don't want to be below grade. And it does take a little bit more cure time than some of the other technologies. Thank you. So we've been referring to dynamic substrate movement uh, quite a bit here. This is uh, basically all types of substrate movements right here. You're looking at flexure as well as a, a longitudinal like shear, and then the compression and extension or expansion and contraction. Um, for this presentation purposes, we're when we're talking dynamic substrate movement, we're talking expansion and contraction. Uh, an illustration of this, uh, let's consider the middle joint to be the installed joint. As the substrate warms up, it would be on this right side. You see the baccarat getting smushed by the expanding substrates. Since the joint has that hourglass shape, it's actually flush with the building. Uh, as you cool down and you go to the left, you see the baccarat extending, the joint extending as the substrates shrink. This would be, and you're looking at, you know, two and a half inches to the two inch. That's just a, you know, a 25% movement due to the climate changes. I'd like to interject here. Notice the shape of the sealant itself over the two inch area. It's called a concave or hourglass shape. That is the correct shape for the uh, maximum movement for a sealant. And so in most of the technologies we've discussed today, uh, you'll read that you should tool these materials um, into that shape. And that's done, you may have seen it with a spoon, finger, whatever they use. Uh, when you're looking at the urethane acrylic, you strike it flat and it automatically cures into that shape. But no matter how you get there, that hourglass shape is necessary. If that was flat on the middle and we we had the expansion we have on the right here that would buckle the joint out. Right, it puts pressure on the joint, typically will release from one side or the other on the substrate and you'll have a failure. Uh, another illustration on proper joint design here. What you want is a two to one joint width to depth ratio. Small chart on the bottom illustrating this. Uh, just a, a note to AU1 can seal two inch gaps with a proper backer rod and proper joint design. So we, we mentioned earlier some ASTM specs and thought just take a moment and really talk about what they mean. So class 25, I want to talk about ASTM C920. There are a number of different ratings there. It's 12 and a half, 25, 35, 50. But what does that really mean? It means under test conditions, not actual conditions in the field. Um, these products can be have a movement or plus or minus whatever that number is, this is a percent. So 12 and a half, 25, 35, 50. So when you're looking at, uh, let's say a 25%, it's plus or minus 25. So a total of 50% joint movement. And while I say not real world, this testing is done in a very rigorous way. Um, the sealants are first immersed or soaked, which we don't recommend. Um, during the testing, you actually shoot liquid nitrogen on the materials as they move. And then you put them through a furnace as well and move them while they're hot. So while you might wonder why we talk about some very high elongations later, and we're only saying 50% total joint movement, one is real world and one is what you have to pass in the test. Um, mentioned a, uh, AU1 has 800% elongation or recovery. So clearly more than 50% there. Uh, when you really look at how buildings are designed, Class 25 meets almost all of the expansion joint requirements for sealants. Uh, there may be some outliers, but it's very, very seldom. Um, and we base all these calculations, of course, are on the movement of the substrate. Many times, companies will create products that have 
higher joint movements by taking their class 12 and a half or 25 and adding a chemical called the plasticizer, which is an oil that interacts with the sealant glue and softens it. And it absolutely allows for more movement, but it increases pack. And it is a migratory chemical, which means over time, it will leave the material. And when it leaves, obviously you do no longer have that same flexibility as when you put it in. So you may have seen sealants that look good for the first season or two, but then crack and break, and you may wonder why that's happening. If they utilize plasticizers, it's because of the plasticizer leach, most likely. Thank you. So we have had the AU1 technology for, for over a decade now. I'd say probably within the last five years, we've really been fighting to get it uh, specified for uh, commercial waterproofing. Um, just a few speeds and feeds. Though. I mean, very, very green product. It is, you know, carbon squamid VOC compliant for a water-based product, which is very green, as well as the fact that you're not using any additional VOCs for cleaning since it's water cleanup. Very easy application. As Robin mentioned, you're striking this flat. You don't have to mix any two components. The colors are mixed in already. The sizes are perfect for every application you're going to do. Um, we obviously have all the colors that you would need, but if there's anything we do know, it's paintability, and this product is extremely paintable. Um, also, that no plasticizers means this performance is going to be over the true lifetime of the joint. Uh, you're not going to get any, you know, leaching into the substrates and no shiners as well. And then uh, we're going to kind of double click on that industry leading durability, but we have uh, some data to back that up. So AU1 is a ASTM C920 class 25. That's 50% total joint movement. Uh, obviously, it, we passed C834. Um, we also meet the E84 uh, flame spread index and smoke develop index values. Um, AU1 passes the retired TTS 230 uh, federal spec, and we meet the physical requirements of AMA 808.3. Um, we touched on the uh, common building substrate adhesion test, but this is very important to us because this is a real world test. This, there's no way to fake this. Um, we use this data because it's very relevant to the building industry and all the different substrates the folks are using. So when you look at the regular ASTM C794, this is the uh, peel adhesion test. This is AU1 on the um, second from the left there and some other technologies. What you're looking at with the bars, these, these represent the substrates. So ASTM requires you to test on ASTM concrete, glass, and aluminum. The performance bar is actually just that five PLI down there. So every one of these products passes no problem and, and will perform in a lab perfectly. What we want to do, though, is take kind of a look at what's going to happen over time. Um, we went ahead and we put all of these competitors on the test fence. We left it in the Gainesville, Georgia heat and sun for up to two years, testing it periodically. Now, over those two years, you could see the uh, the darker bar is the initial, the, the lighter gray is one year and the red is two years. There are some products that really start to drop off. AU1 really just plateaus. We lose about 12% adhesion and then it stays. Uh, as the plasticizer or the silicon oils, anything leaves these other products, we're really seeing diminishing adhesion values. And with that comes uh, some other modes of failure. Um, but, but some of these products lost up to 50% of their adhesion in these two years. So this is where the technical guy gets to have some fun. I love show and tells, especially ones that are obvious. And so this is a durability test. It's uh, the xenon arc is a fit. Just think of it as an artificial sun. It gives UV at a very controlled amount. Uh, this test can go many more cycles, but uh, we had to stop it at five cycles. And this is about 4,000 hours. Uh, the reason we had to stop is because the polyurethane has failed to the point where if we continued the test, it would dissolve. And you can definitely see this is a commercially available polyurethane that's used in the field today and compare that to the urethane acrylic. And the 
perception in the marketplace has always been that silicones or urethanes are going to be much more durable. But when you actually do the testing and include the UV and the heat and the moisture, you can see that it's not even close. The AU1 significantly is outperforming the polyurethane. Good. This is probably even a better example, although you really have to look at it to see what's going on. So it's a durability test in the xenon arc, but it's through glass. And so in other words, the light is going through the glass and hitting the sealant. So if you're adhering to a substrate where the light can get to it, you can see that both polyurethanes failed where the UV was going through. You can see they pulled away all the way apart. AU1, the urethane acrylic, has no failure whatsoever. And this is perhaps my favorite of all for the whole presentation. So this is uh, accelerated weathering with just a fluorescent UV. This is a test that probably most people do know in terms of the type of UV tests. Uh, we went ahead and uh, ran 6,400 hours with the uh, urethane acrylic. We had to stop the polyurethane at a little over 2,000 hours. At 2,000 hours, the urethane was starting to buckle. You can see up at the top where it's actually starting to come off. If we'd waited any longer, it would have fell off. And so kind of would have ruined my show and tell. And what we want to do here, show, I mean, who has ever seen a sidewalk with a urethane in those cracks where the urethane isn't cracked? We all know it, it fails, but we all continue to use it. We're not willing to move to the new technology. All we're saying is take a look at the performance in real world. Yep. Speaking of the real world, actually. Um, this is more of a kind of a case study on the whole thing. Um, we had two identical warehouses built. Uh, this is, I mean, less than a year ago. And we were used as the waterproofing um, expansion joints on one. Uh, the waterproofer chose to use a polyurethane on another. Uh, less than a year later, we can revisit these warehouses take a look at the expansion joints and see exactly what we're talking about. So the top left is the AU1. Coating is very uniform, same color as the slab. The polyurethanes have been discolored and in some places are just showing straight up failure, um, cracking and um, adhesion loss. The bottom pictures are both what I would call plasticizer migration, uh, the the sealant becomes very tacky. Uh, the landscaping was still getting done on this warehouse and unluckily for them, there is red Georgia clay pinstriping the building. So not only is this, you know, an aesthetic nightmare, but uh, you end up letting water in here. So, we, you know, just to, to reiterate, why are we looking at AU1 and why are we feeling so strong about this product? It's very green and safe. It is very easy to apply. We have superior durability and it is a better value. It is a true lifetime sealant. Um, when you're specifying something like this, you don't have to worry about, especially the aesthetics or, or the performance. I mean, you can, you can go to a strip mall and take a look at an expansion joint and you, you can see that dirt build up right now um, as kind of an illustration or a real world application there. So let's get into some of the uh, product innovation here. Uh, we're going to kind of zoom in on liquid applied flashing. The AU1 liquid applied flashing is a styrene butadiene resin. This is a waterproof barrier for rough openings. Uh, this started as a Miami-Dade building code requirement. Uh, this AMA 714-22 and dash 19, but it has spread uh, all the way up uh, the state of Florida. There are builders using it in, I mean, I've heard and seen in almost every state in the United States now as kind of an extra piece of insurance for wind-driven rain. It's just an extra um, waterproofing method on top for these rough openings. So very uh, compatible with green concrete and uh, we're, you know, soap and water cleanup. This is still a water-based product. The styrene butadiene resin is a great technology for this application. You don't see it in any of our sealants. But this is brush, roll, spray, or trowel, and there's no primer needed. As you can see, uh, the 
the illustration there kind of helps with uh, explain the 714-22. This is one of the tests. There is a mechanical fastener, a nail, and a screw in each of those without and with images. Um, the liquid applied flashing has to self-heal or wrap around the fastener without letting any of the moisture in. You can see what this looks like versus without using a liquid applied flashing. Um, you're going to see this product in new uh, commercial construction, the tilt walls, uh, podium construction, or any wood with cladding, uh, um, multifamily apartments, high rises, even just new and uh, renovated residential homes. And the substrates are, you know, wood, CMU, concrete, OSB, and uh, even house wrap. So... When we talk about the AMA test, you know, I want to give a little bit of a feel for the type of testing that's done here. And this is 714, uh, this one's 22, 19 slightly different. So the first one we get into, of course, is just adhesion. And it's very similar uh, uh, to the sealants with five PLI minimum. And um, of course, our products are gonna pass the test that I'm gonna talk about today. Um, the second one is, <clears throat> excuse me, the test that you just saw a picture of where it's penetration uh, water around fasteners. And we're looking for uh, no liquids to pass around those fasteners. Uh, 5.3, uh, we're looking at accelerated UV. So we wanna make sure that UV doesn't damage the properties we're talking about. And again, it's even after being exposed to UV. Um, five four is kind of interesting. It is elevated temperature. There are actually levels. You don't have to pass all three to claim this, uh, but 50 degrees, 65 degrees, and 80 degrees. And then again, looking at peel adhesion, uh, the AU1 passes all those, but again, other products definitely can claim this, but they have to claim the level that they're at. So, you know, if that's important to you, particularly in Florida, I would think that you'd want to, or Texas, have you know, the higher levels. Um, thermal cycling, uh, again, another test that actually talks about placing these products um, into ovens, heating them over time, cycling them back to cold, and then, <clears throat> excuse me, checking peel adhesion. So adhesion is critical, obviously, for this to work. Crack bridging is probably the most difficult test. Uh, crack bridging is taking the material between Think of two, S, two OSB boards coming together in a job and where there's wind loads, deflection, you're gonna get movement at the joint. What we wanna make sure is that this product doesn't crack or pull apart, that it maintains a seal over that small area. And so that's what's called uh, crack bridging. Um, water immersion, again, looking to make sure that uh, you don't have, excuse me, uh, any significant differences in either visual or physical changes. And then water vapor permeability is extremely important. It's one that might be overlooked. Um, you know, you want to quote unquote waterproof a wall, but you actually don't. What you want to do is stop liquid water from penetrating, but you want to allow a moisture to leave the building. Uh, that's why Tyvek and others has a permeance of somewhere around 12 um, think about failures in this area. The original EAPS systems that were envelope systems, the water got behind those systems, could not find a way out, and did a lot of damage. I'm sure most of you are aware of what happened in North Carolina with those kind of buildings, and there was significant uh, damage and liability. Uh, our product definitely meets the same type of permeants that you have with Tyvek. I believe that we're at 13 currently for our permeants. So what we're finding is that a lot of the competitors that we have have trouble with uh, stucco compatibility. And we tested this with a lot. We can't control the composition of the stucco. So we always recommend, you know, you set up a test panel, but we've had a, a lot of success with this. Um, just a quick review there. You can use the application method of your choice. Uh, this product can be left uncovered for up to six months. That's that UV stability. This is great for uh, a larger building that's kind of waiting to be cladded. 
Uh, that bright blue is actually perfect because we need to make sure there are no pinholes as you're applying this product, especially if it's by brush or roller. And then we have also tested compatibility with all the popular uh, house wraps and flashing tapes that we can find. And so far, so good. So one thing to take a look at too in the future here as uh, this product category grows is we have some customers using this as a complete vapor barrier system. Uh, it's very breathable. You don't need to prime it. Um, very easy to apply. And then, like I said, this is an extra piece of insurance where moisture is or can possibly be an issue. This also adds efficiency, and this is very green. So uh, I would say take a look for some additional testing data coming uh, very soon here on that. With that, we'd like to open it up with questions. We'd like to thank you for your audience and uh, hope you learned something today. Awesome. All right. So we do have some questions and a reminder for anyone who might not have submitted one yet, feel free to submit your questions now so that we can get to them live. Um, all right. I'm just going to kind of start off at the top and uh, we'll work our way through. So first off, can AU1 be utilized in remediating the shrinkage cracks in concrete walls? Yeah, I mean, uh, the sealant uh, AU1 is excellent for uh, fixing smaller cracks. Uh, you need to make sure that the substrate is clean. If there is any material that's still in the crack that's still loose, you want to re remove that. But in terms of filling that and being able to coat over it, absolutely. Awesome. All right, and then how does AU1 behave in submerged members? Is that like... Submerged as in like water, like water immersion. If it's if you're speaking about, I assume you're speaking about uh, water immersion, and we don't recommend the product for uh, water immersion. The nature of te technology as a water-based product it doesn't play with that, that application. But even non-water-based, most silicones don't allow for immersion either. It's just something yeah. that you have to specially formulate for, and it's not part of this product. Got it. All right. Is the AU1 a good waterproofing product for underfloor tiles in a shower or a wet environment? Honestly, I don't have experience to answer that question. We don't really see it used under tiles. Um, people are, you know what, I'm, I'm going to acknowledge that I just don't have experience in that. I assume that you're looking for some, some sort of membrane before you put the adhesive and tile down. Wow. I just don't have a good answer on that one. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's not what it was designed for. I guess we can answer that, but yeah, yeah there's. Great, right, great. Um, let's see, does CMU really need to receive a weather barrier or a vapor barrier? Is it, where's it? It's right there. Concrete? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Uh, we see wind-driven rain and hurricanes go directly through concrete block and wet the inside of a home. Um, mm -hmm. It's a fairly, concrete blocks are a fairly porous material. Mm -hmm. And so absolutely, I believe that they should have a, a water barrier, whether that be Tyvek or some other, in this case, uh, a flashing material. Mm -hmm. All right. How would you apply in a residential application as shown in the last slide? Can it be sprayed or is it rolled on only? You can definitely do both. Um, you know, some if, in a residential application, if you have the tools to spray it, we like spraying. It's very easy. It's very quick. But we've definitely seen people doing it in both roller and with brushes. I haven't really seen people using trowels, but they can do that as well. You just need to make sure you get to the millage. Yeah, the yeah. The key would be a consistent application so all pinholes are eliminated, whether you're using block, OSB, or other. Uh, you want to have a consistent layer of the flashing to prevent penetration by water. Right. Can you dilute the AU1 for full liquid wall barrier? Um, 
We would recommend if you're doing using the material not to dilute it. It is designed to have the permeance, um, the adhesion, everything is designed as is. It should be ready to go. You should be able to spray. If, if, if the question is to get it to be uh, uh, sprayed, yeah. you just need it. What was it, a 610? 621. 621 tip we used to, to apply it, be a sprayer. Mm -hmm. All right. Would this be a substitute for Dowsil 995, 1199, and 795, in particular adhering glass to wood? I believe I stated earlier that we don't want to be a structural issue. So when you're talking about using uh, something, a material like um, the 995, to adhere glass directly to wood without mechanical attachment, the answer is no. Great. Um, with zip panel failures, can you go over the top to remediate? The, what type of failure are we speaking of in terms of that? It's it's a little bit difficult. If you're talking about like where it's either the tape has come off and you want to fill the crack, the AU1 sealant uh, would work very good in those applications. Um, I'm not sure what type of failure we're talking about. All right, Omar, if you want to give us a little bit more information on that, then we can answer that further. Also, if it feels easier to explain out loud, um, anyone in the audience can feel free to raise your hand. And if you want to ask your question out loud, um, we can unmute you. You don't have to turn video on, um, but that can be another way to give us some more information about what you're looking for. All right. Looks like we have a few questions about um, if folks can receive a copy of the slides. Um, so would that be something that you'd be willing to share? Yes, absolutely. All right, awesome. Okay, and it looks like we got some more clarity on the zip panel failures. Um, so port installation, pockets in tape and nail penetrations. Yeah, I mean, for the pockets and, you know, poor installation, again, that is a difficult, I don't know how poor, I'm, I'm careful about making a blatant, a blanket statement on poor installation. Pockets in the tape, you would cut the tape away. Uh, they would probably recommend putting new tape on, but you can absolutely fill the joint areas with sealant. And we've done some quick tests on that. Do kind of a butterfly joint, if you know what that is, where it goes into the joint, but also a little bit on either side. And then I think you mentioned nail penetrations. We absolutely have people using AU1 to cover nail penetrations to make sure there's no water infiltration around the nail. Awesome. All right. It looks like that might wrap up our questions. Um, we have a few more moments. So while we wait to see if there are any other questions from today's audience, I'm just going to give a quick little refresher for anyone who might have missed this portion uh, at the beginning. Um, show you guys how to get in touch with Tower Sealants after today's webinar. So if you have any follow-up questions, um, you can feel free to contact them directly on Ace Lab. So I'll just share my screen and quickly show everyone that. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to submit them to the Q&A now, and we should have some time to get to them. Um, but everyone who signed up for today's webinar automatically has a free Ace Lab account. You can use this search bar to type in the name of any manufacturer, head over to their page on Ace Lab, so here we're on Tower Sealants page, and you can just click this contact button to get in touch with their team directly. Um, that's going to create a conversation for you, which you can get back to over here in your workspace, heading to conversations. And you'll also get an email notification about any new messages in that conversation. You can reply directly to that email. It'll log in Ace Labs platform as well. So it's a really great way to kind of keep your communication organized along with your product research and get any questions answered after today's event. All right, looks like we do have a few more questions here. So what is the top building height for AU1 use in exterior walls? What was the question? Um, yeah, like is there a max height for yeah. use in exterior walls? At this point, there is, there is no height limitation for the use of AU1. No height limitation, awesome. As long as you're above grade. <laughs> cool. And then and as I'll a... go back to Mr. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I, I saw Mr. Hastings come or, or 
Hastings, Reed Hastings, as a follow-up to the Dallasil, uh, purely ceiling role. Uh, because I, I'm concerned about the application, I'm just going to say no. Mm -hmm. Technical people are notoriously conservative. That's a crazy yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd add on to that real quick, Mr. Reed, as well. Uh, we found whenever the glass and the frame going into the building substrate, AU1 has performed fantastic and is great for installation. Most of the what, what are called glazers that are adhering the glass to the actual frame, they prefer a technology that hardens very quickly and does not have flexibility. Uh, and so the, even though in a lot of those applications, AU1 could work, uh, there's such a, a history of just working quickly and having the sealant cure fast. And then, as we mentioned, that's one of the limitations is AU1 does take a little bit longer to cure. So I think that's a tougher application for this product. Mm -hmm. All right, great. Well, then I think that might wrap up our questions. Um, so if anybody does have any other questions that come up as you're leaving today's webinar, um, obviously you can go to uh, the Tower Sealants page on Ace Lab and ask your questions there. That's a great place to do it because you can also easily upload any project details that you might want to share with them to kind of help explain uh, your question or your uh, inquiry. And then there are all are also going to be a quick post-event survey as you leave today's webinar um, that'll pop up automatically. If you have some time to fill out that survey and give us any feedback, that's super helpful for us to keep bringing you content that's relevant to you. Um, and you can also feel free to submit any questions that you might have uh, on that survey as well. All right, awesome. So there are no more last minute questions. I just wanna thank everyone in the audience today for coming out and for uh, thinking of such thoughtful and engaging questions. And thank you so much to Joe and Rob and the team at Tower Sealants for presenting today's topic. It's really great to learn about such a new and innovative product um, and how it can be used to you know, really improve project outcomes. Thank you and thank you everyone. Thank you. All right, awesome. Have a great day. You too.